Hey, Rob, what's happening, man? Hey, not too much. How are you doing? Hey, great, man. That's a very good mic you got there. Sweet. Yeah, it's just an Amazon thing, so sounds glad super, it works. Sounds, sounds super clear. Well, hey, thanks for joining. I was excited uh, for listeners. Somehow I ran into Rob online on Twitter, and then I looked. He has this really cool sock company, and then I read that he was a professional biker, which sort of makes sense with the cool socks. So thanks for joining, man. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. So how did you get started in biking? Oh, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, like any kid, um, learned to ride a bike. But I, I grew up um, in Pickering, Ontario. So, you know, somewhat Middle Eastern or Middle <laughs> Middle Eastern, uh, Eastern Canada. Um, and, you know, grew up in a, a hockey family. Uh, so that was kind of the sport of the household. And so grew up playing hockey a lot. Biking was just something to do for fun. Um, but I never quite enjoyed hockey. Uh, and so, you know, like, I think when I was finally allowed to stop playing, I started to think like, you know, what's the sport for me? All the kind of team sports, I just it didn't come natural to me, uh, like basketball, volleyball, all those kind of things you would play in school. Um, it just, I wasn't very good at it, um, but I was always fairly athletic and coordinated, but just those things never felt right. And then just, you know, cycling just came natural to me. You know, it just, it was just exciting. I was good at it. I was improving. Um, and really what kind of kicked things off was this, there was this TV show called Drop In. Uh, it was a bunch of like guys from BC, probably late teens, early twenties that like bought a bus got some TV uh, like rights, they, they made a show and they would just travel around all of the, t the popular uh, destinations in BC and, and ride. So it was like, you know, up Island or in, uh, uh, in the interior. And I was just fascinated by this. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever is these guys can just ride their bike and do these. It was when free riding was becoming very popular. And so I just started to build those stunts in my local forest when I was about, oh, 12, 13 years old. Um, and really enjoyed that. So built a, a little bike park and we actually built the bike park so large that the city, uh, came in and taped it all off and threatened to like press legal action if we continued to build it. Cause it was, I was taking it quite seriously. And in hindsight, that was kind of like my entrepreneurial drive. I was like, I'm going to build a bike park. I'm going to build a bike park. We would haul lumber in there. My parents would drive me to home Depot. We'd haul in tons of lumber and build all these like North shore stunts. And it was all kind of well manicured and it was like, a, like what you'd see today on the, the city developed bike parks we basically built one um every summer and then yeah the city came in and kind of ruined that dream and i think the first sort of uh my first sort of kind of pitch was okay i'm gonna go to city council then and, and pitch them to build one um so i made like a little pitch deck and it's hilarious i had a brand it was called hucker bike park had an HB logo. I had all the reasons why it made sense. It's like, look, you already make skate parks, like cycling's taking off, you know, cycling parks make a ton of sense. This will be a trend. Uh, and I was early, you know, they, they shut me down and said, patted me on the head and said, go good, good job, kid. Like, but get lost. Uh, and now if you look around these, these bike parks and pump tracks are everywhere. Um, it just took 15 years for the cities to realize that this was catching on. Um, so now in hindsight, it was pretty funny. You know, we built that because out of a need, it was fairly, you know, entrepreneurial and, uh, and then, you know, lobbied to get it done legally. They didn't want to do it. Um, that's a bit of an aside, but from there, I, I started to, uh, get into the racing side. I worked at a bike shop as every, you know, young cyclist does. And a, a guy there was like, Hey, there's a local race, um, at the local ski hill. Do you want to go? And so I showed up and tried it and just had a blast. And I was just super hooked. Um, is and this, so my dad, this mount, 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 sorry to interrupt, Rob, is this mountain bike just for listeners? Is this doing BMX stuff? Is this mountain bike riding? What, how would you describe it or what is it called? I'd call it mountain biking. So what I started doing was like free ride style. So tricks and just, you know, messing around on the mountain bike. And then the race was downhill mountain biking. So it was, I'd say for people that don't know, it's like the downhill ski equivalent, but on a bike. So time trial, start at the top of the mountain, go to the end. You're not racing anyone at the same time. You're racing the clock and the person with the fastest time wins. And you're going on an average speed of 40 to 60 kilometers an hour through the trees, jumps, rocks uh, for about three to five minutes, at least on bigger courses. In Ontario, they were like 45 seconds to one minute long because we don't have much elevation. Um, so at the local ski hill, I did that race and I was just hooked. 
And my dad kind of saw that I was really interested in my parents and they would uh, take me to all the races and, and pretty quickly um, started to get pretty good. I think a few races in, I started winning them. Um, and then about a year in, I went to my first national race, which was in Quebec. Um, and I was pretty cocky. I was like winning the, the, the uh, provincial races at the time. And I just got my ass whooped and it was pretty humbling. Uh, but I remember like on the drive home being so upset and frustrated. I was like, Hey, there's another one in a few weeks and I'm going to win that one. Just kind of like a somewhat delusional optimism. Cause I got smoked. There was no, I wasn't even in the arena, uh, on this first one, but showed up to the second one and super determined and just believed I could do it and somehow pulled it off. I won the second one. Um, and won the whole Canada Cup in the junior uh, junior division. And that was in 2008. So it was an Olympic year. So world championships for mountain biking was earlier in the year to account for like the, the athletes to go to the Olympics. So the Olympics were very early. And so that one win named me the Canadian national team. And I was still in high school. I had no idea what the national team was. That's how early on in racing I was. This must have been my under 10 races under my belt. Uh, I remember getting an email and uh, it was from the national team. They're like, hey, you've been you know, nominated the team, would you like to go to Italy to race world champs? It was in Val de Sol. And I remember replying being like, no, I've got school. I don't even know what world champs is. Like, I don't, uh, and another funny side of that is I didn't even own a downhill bike at the time. I was doing it on my, my kind of freestyle slope style bike, um, which was also pretty funny. So showed my parents the email after I replied, no. And they're like, Rob, what did you do? Like, you should go do this. And, um, emailed them back and said, you know, just joking. Like I would love to go. I borrowed a bike from a friend packed my bags. I didn't know where Italy was. I thought Italy was somewhere in North America. Like I was just oblivious, right? I was like 15 or 16 years old. I had no idea what the whole, like, how the sport really worked. I hadn't traveled. My whole world was Pickering, Ontario. Uh, and that just kind of launched me on this career of making the team the five years after a 10 year career, racing my bike, traveled all over the world, learned a ton of great lessons, but it really just started out of this delusional optimism that I could win, I could do it. And, and mind you, like every odd was against me too. Like I was racing in a sport that required mountains and elevation. And I lived in a farm city with no mountains, you know, like uh, it was, it, and that's really been kind of the stepping stone for my life of realizing that like, it is possible. There's just multiple ways to attack a problem. Um, and really it comes down to mindset and sure you got to put yourself and position yourself right and work hard, but what may seem like limitations often can be an advantage as well. Because like one, one story I'll share is, so I've reflected on a lot of like how I made it work and turned this kind of, you know, unrealistic idea into a great opportunity is I didn't have the luxury of doing three to five minute runs to train for my sport. I had to basically build 10 to 15 second sections on my local hillside of the track and dissect it. And what that forced me to do is become ultra precise. So I had to, because it was only 15 seconds and the short, the shorter the time period, the more precise you have to be, the, the milliseconds count when you're timing yourself and improving. Um, and so I would, I would, I would be improving by milliseconds. Whereas my friends who were training on the West coast, they would be doing three to five minute runs and trying to improve on multiple seconds. And so like they're in the mindset of, if I mess up one corner, no problem, there's another one coming and I'll just improve on my way down. I was in the mindset that everything had to be perfect. Every corner, everything had to be precise. And so I would then go to the race course and be able to dissect it, pick it apart, think of the sections in my head and put a run together that was just much more precise than what I'm imagining those people that I was competing against were, were kind of attacking the problem because they were more focused on you know, I've got a longer period to make this right where I was just focused on I've got a short period of time to make this right. I think that ended up being a benefit also because I could, the, the thing is we raced on tracks that you didn't get to go ride. Um, so when you showed up, it was kind of a clean slate for the most part. Everyone was trying to learn the track on a three day weekend. Um, and so this, the quicker you could dissect it, understand it, become precise, the more likely you are to, to do pretty well. So I was able to really understand and you know, like when I would go to trails and ride with people, I was never the most talented rider. Like I actually took a long time to warm up to a new trail because like, I just, I wasn't, I was, I was more of a tactician. I was more prepared. I was more like attacking the sport, like an entrepreneur in hindsight, honestly, like I really enjoyed the kind of preparation side of it and the competition. I was never the most talented cyclist, but it ended up uh, like kind of like the peak of my career was in 2011, where I won like the whole national series. So put like, and that's, 
by winning multiple races in the season or placing high. So it's a consistency game too. It's not just winning a one-off. It's over a, a three-month season being the most consistent and, and fastest rider. So that's the long-winded kind of like how I got into cycling, but a lot of cool lessons in hindsight of why I think sport is such a fantastic teacher. It's such a great conduit to business. It's it's such a great just teacher in general. I think sport is one of the last things that we have that really instills the idea that everything is earned and not owed. You can't just show up without doing the work. It's, you're going to be pretty exposed. In modern society, that's ringing less and less true. Um, and so I, I really in business today kind of even approach that like sport i say i'm just i'm still in sport and that was the whole motivation of starting it's just my sport now is business uh and i get to wake up with that same fire and that same excitement to kind of attack the problems and have that competitive mindset and it's just been super super fun to find something that i can now do that you know now i'm in my early 30s my body doesn't want to hit trees anymore it never did but i don't i don't bounce back as quickly uh this is a little more uh a little more uh longevity built into this side of this uh, my life now so so did you you did that full time for 12 or 15 years basically be it with sponsors and everything like did you figure all that out because it sounds like you're just a kid in the park who had some talent had some fun and like and not dumbed into it because a lot of people try to practice but just fell into it and then leaned into it but there's that that's a that's a whole business unto itself. I mean, getting to the races, buying the bike, buying the equipment, staying in the hotel, I mean, the whole the whole nine yards. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I um luckily by um doing well pretty early on, I attracted the attention of some teams and sponsors. And so again, just by like what I'll call luck, but was just a lot of hard work and positioning you know, caught the attention of these people. And so, yeah, I got free bikes. I got incentives to be paid for results, um, arrangements for travel and all of that. But it was a lot of hard work. I, I never had an agent. I never got to the level. I was a great Canadian pro. I wasn't a great, like, world-ranked pro. I, like, I think my best world finish was about 39th, which was still, like, you know, 39th in the world. I'm, I'm not mad about that. But I, I certainly wasn't um, the world champion or that. So I wasn't making – and the sport of downhill mountain biking doesn't have a lot of money in it to begin with. Um, and so if you're not in the top 20 of, of the world, you're not making any money, basically you're, you're working during the winters. So I had a lot of part-time odd end jobs, um, you know, like home Depot or mountain equipment co-op. So I got, I got to live this life of kind of like pro athlete, but also got the humble experience of working retail, which was interesting. And so it was kind of this like d two lessons being learned at all times. Um, but I did have sponsors. I negotiated all my own contracts, which helped, when I moved into business, obviously I got to understand, you know, what were their incentives? What did I get out of it? How did I have to deal with the athlete kind of sponsor relationship, booking my own logistics too. So figuring out how to get around the world, um, especially Europe where everything's very difficult, <laughs> uh, different languages. I remember like flying into Switzerland and then flying to the other side of Switzerland and in one area, they're speaking Spanish, the other area, they're speaking French. And I was just so confused. It's like, what's going on? Uh, and it's just learning all of these kind of lessons along the way. But I mean, all of these great things I didn't know at the time, but I was just learning worldwide logistics, which we deal with every day now in our business. I was learning uh, athlete contracts. I was learning the business models of different businesses, like what was important to some of my sponsors. I had a, funny enough, a sock sponsor. So I understood the sock business before starting my own sock business. So, um, and then had to manage my finances on top of that, because like I had to run a tight personal P&L because, uh, you know, I had to have some money left over at the end to kind of train and invest in uh, coaches and stuff like that, the things that I would invest in the professional development on my side. So yeah, it was uh, 10 years, about 10 years, probably about six or seven of taking it quite seriously where I was out of the house and living on my own um, as like a young adult. But uh, it was an experience for sure. Not easy. Did you go to college while you were riding professionally? I stopped and started. Um, so like right out of high school, again, I come from a very traditional family, like, you know, hockey school go to university get the job so i was kind of an outlier and caused my parents a lot of a lot of uh sleepless nights i know for sure um so i, I did go to school like against 
I didn't want to go, um, but I went, I went to university, Brock University for kinesiology, and I, I just didn't do well. But during that year, that's when I got my first kind of like team contracts. Everything was falling in line for cycling. I was like, I finished the year. I didn't do well, but I was like, I'm not going back. I'm going racing. So I dropped out. Um, and then I think I started and stopped like two other times within that seven or eight year period. Got some courses under my belt, but never quite finished. Um, I ended up finally going back to college here on the West Coast. Cause I live in Victoria, BC now. And I got to apply some of those credits and actually have a sport management diploma under my belt now. But it was like, you know, it took me about eight, nine years to get a two year diploma. So I stopped and started, but I mean, not because I wanted to go certainly during those, those first years. And I don't think it benefited me much. If anything, it was a drawback. I think that um, people, and I appreciate you sharing it, don't understand that you'll see professional mountain bikers or they're not odd sports, but they're not the headline sports, right? It's not tour de France biking. It's, or, or it's, um, there, there's a lot of different subset segments of all the sports, right? Like U S soccer versus European soccer and things like that. I don't think people realize that <clears throat> even though you might have 500,000 Instagram followers or whatever people have, you're, you're actually working a job in retail or something to actually make that happen because there's real, really no money as it relates into professional money at some of these sports. I mean, getting a free bike and getting free supplements and that sort of stuff's cool, but you still got to live. You still got to have money to do these things, to buy your car, pay your mortgage, pay your rent and things like that. And not often do you actually get to see that. And it's like surfing, right? I mean, you have surfers who are, who are wildly air quotes popular in, in the social media or a perception, but you know, they're working at the local uh, market to basically pay the bill so they can go surfing all the time. And, you know, I, I think that's worth mentioning sometimes because as a young adult, including myself and seeing that stuff, it becomes an unrealistic expectation. Like, Hey, this is going to be a little harder. My brother was on the path to be a professional skateboarder and, um, and he rode for Palin Peralta and all that sort of stuff when he was young. And that's super cool. Right. But, there's only like Tony Hawk and he, he was an East coast, um, rider. It was really him and Bucky Lassick who Bucky still has a career, but Bucky has a automobile business. I mean, you know, the only person that's probably really only doing skateboarding for real is Tony Hawk. Um, you know, and everybody else is, is making it, making it go, but, um, still having to hustle in the background. So I think that's important just because it's unrealistic expectations. In your case, you didn't sound like you had any expectations. You were just like, hey, I'm going to ride my bike. You actually want me to come to Italy? Like, hey, let's roll, right? Yeah, I think that's how it starts. And you're totally right. Like the majority, I'd say 99.9% .9 of professional athletes don't really make any money, at least that they can save after the whole the whole thing's done. And the top 1% of the 1% certainly make a lot. And, 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 that, and for good reason, they drive – the sales for the brands that sponsor them. It's a, again, just all tied to incentives and kind of what they can generate. But um, yeah, what seems like a lot of money when you're, uh, when you're young turns out is not a lot of money. Uh, and it's funny just to kind of like put a bow on that. I talked about that show of all those people I idolize called drop in. And I was like, my perception as a young kid was like, these guys must be millionaires. They're on TV. They have a bus. They don't have jobs. I know a lot of those guys like now, and I got to meet them and stuff. And like, they were, broke as a joke you know like and some of them made like a bit of money but like they're certainly uh they weren't making a lot then but they were chasing their dream and they did something cool so there's there's, there's certainly a value to that but um there is definitely a big disjoint between like perception and reality when it comes to pro sport and it can be humbling and exciting but uh it's, it's certainly a tough path yeah i just hear that i i, I had a life as a quote unquote professional fisherman. Cause that's what I did. I, I ran the largest fishing site on the internet and you know, it looked cool. I mean, it, you get to travel the world, go fishing all the time and, and all that. But you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't own a G five or a G eight now. Like, it, is there a path to that? Yeah. Maybe if you're Johnny Morris and Bass Pro Shops, but that's a different model. That's, that's called business, not 
fishing. And there are some pros who make some decent money in the bass fishing circuit, but that's not an easy life either. The same thing with golf. Like I was watching that Netflix show. I don't know if you saw it on these professional golfers and yeah, like professional golfers in, in that top 10 probably make good living, probably the top five or really, you know, have jets, but everyone else is like, you know, just trying to make it happen. It doesn't mean it's bad. Like, I agree with you. I don't look back and like, oh, that sucked. Like, didn't suck. But at some point I did have a little light bulb go off in my head. That was like, um, a lot of these people like don't have the big house. The, the customer, the cost the, you know, the clients are the one with the big house coming here and it feels like they own the businesses. So maybe that's the way to go. Um, and you know, I don't want to, I'm not here and I know you're not like, I say, Hey, if you're into biking or fishing or golfing or like, go for it, man. Like, you know, do it in your twenties. You, there's, you have nothing to lose at that point. And if you make it like awesome, if you don't, it's not too late, but don't lose sight along the way that eventually you will probably want to own a house. There's this thing called the price of the house and a mortgage that's due on the 30th and it doesn't get paid with points from the downhill biking or the big fish that you caught. They think that's cool, but it doesn't, for some reason, Rob, it doesn't pay the bill. So I think it's just keeping an eye on that and not losing track of it. Cause the worst thing you would want is to be 39 years old with no career. And all of a sudden you're, you're an analyst working with a 22 year old who's going to outwork you. That's just a fact, right? Like, people in you're in your early twenties, you're the people who are in those positions are just going to, they're going to outwork you. And yeah, you have energy when you're older, but um, it's different. <laughs> and you're probably feeling it even in your thirties, right? Like it's just different being an athlete even. Yeah. I think the important lesson there is to just as an athlete, like understand the skills you're learning alongside the sport. So like I, in hindsight, learned a lot of lessons, but also know when to pull the shoot. You know, I, I still have friends that I raced with that I was beating or competitive with at the time. They're still hanging on to the dream. And, you know, I'm now like eight, nine years removed from it. And I'm just like, man, like, look at how our lives differed. And I'm not saying they have to start a business and do things like that. But it's like, you got to know when to kind of change the dream, you know, evolve the dream. It's far too many athletes hang on to it because, uh, your ego is attached to it. And it's, it's tough to walk away because you lose your identity. You have to re kind of, especially as an athlete, you have to, you know, you have to kind of reimagine yourself and say like, what's this next chapter look like? It can be scary. Um, so it's not easy, but now again, in hindsight, I wish I walked away a few years earlier. I definitely hang on, hung on too long. Like I said, I kind of peaked in 2011. Uh, I didn't walk away till 2014. So, and that just cause injuries piled up and, and I made, bad decisions around certain things like a lot of young kids do. So like nothing, nothing like legally or anything like that, but just like not, not, you know, taking things as seriously as I should or being caught up in other things that aren't as important. Um, and so like, again, those are also good things to reflect on and be like, I don't want to make those mistakes again with this, this new opportunity with business. You know, I'm going to stay super focused. I'm not going to take, um, kind of, uh, not take, I'm going to take full advantage of the opportunity in front of me. So yeah, to kind of, um, I just uh, yeah, fully agree and just knowing when to walk away and, and also know what you're doing. Cause like you said, like if you're in your early twenties, like go for it, why not live your life a little bit, but the sport doesn't have to just be the sport either. You can learn a lot of great lessons. And when I started my business, uh, I took a lot of my cycling contacts with me and was able to leverage those to grow. Like, how do I get my socks on athletes? For example, well, a bunch of my friends were pros, like, great. I'm going to put them on them. I don't have to pay them because they're my friends. Or do I have existing sponsors that I can make custom socks for? Um, great. Like, let's do that. So there's also your, your, your network and just, you have a bit of leverage as a former, like as someone that's done something before, that's a great, in, like a great way to de-risk someone taking a bet on you. Like even when I was, um, trying to build, you know, like when I was finding investors for my current business later on, it's like, okay, I built this business, it's doing all right. But I also had a, a history of taking this kind of crazy dream and, and making something of it and being like, okay, well, people bet on people, right? And so like, you want to see that someone's done something that they've taken a risk on themselves. I would say like, 
don't expect someone to take a risk on you if you're not willing to take a risk on yourself because like they'll see right through that and so um the more you can do these things put the reps in taking risks and failing failing forward learning from the lessons it's like that's the other great thing about sport it's just like so if you're gonna go for it and try and the likelihood is it's not going to work out but you'll learn so many lessons that you can take with you it's like it's been you know like i never made retirement money or any great money from sport but it's been the foundation from what i've made now and, and it's worked out quite well how do you know when to quit for me um i stopped dreaming about it that's like what i tell people is like i for like 10 years, basically, I would like go to bed dreaming about the goals, waking up with that fire in my belly. And I think it was just, it, it got hard to the point where I was getting injured all the time. The results weren't coming. Like it just, it just wasn't as fun anymore. I think the the kind of the, like the passion was, was, was weaning and like, it just, it just stopped becoming the most important thing in my life. And I was just like, like kind of had to make a decision. It's like, I have to either recommit and really go for this again and, and put in a couple of years to rebound and try, and then maybe it works or, or kind of just wind it down and start to figure out what's next. And, you know, when I, when I kind of looked realistically at it and luckily I had people in my corner that could give me an outside perspective too, like my girlfriend at the time and now wife, and she had been with me through all the ups and downs. And when you talk about not making money, you know, it's like, okay, you know, your, your partner who's committed to you is looking like, Hey, when are you going to get your shit together? When are you going to actually like, Hey, I want to, instead of you being gone all summer, I want to go on a trip, you know? And like, and if this isn't working, then like we, we can't keep doing the same thing every year. And so luckily surrounding yourself with strong people that can give you perspective as well as helpful. Um, no one forced me to stop. It just like helped me see things that I was maybe missing. Cause again, one of the, the, like a beneficial trait of both an athlete and a entrepreneur is that that delusion that you have and it can serve you but it can hinder you as well like you have to be super optimistic and uh extremely hopeful things are going to work out and sometimes that can blind you um when things are just quite simply not going to work or you're approaching the problem wrong or the runways run out so yeah i just stopped dreaming and then had a lot of perspective and time to reflect and just realized it was time uh, and it was too, it was a few years later than it should have been. Like I said, you know, like it just, so that was the other thing is it was kind of just winding down over time and was finally ready. Did you plan this and say, okay, this is my last race. This is what I'm going to do next. Or did you just do a race and you're like, okay, on the way home, that's it. And then figure it out from there. I think I, I had planned to do a slightly scaled back version. The next year I was going to like, just commit to doing the races I enjoyed going to more of the national series, not trying to go overseas. So it's already kind of like hedging a little bit, but, and that was the plan. And, and kind of once the off season started to kick off and it's like, okay, let's get the coach to start training or, and like resign the sponsorship, sponsorship contracts. It's like, what's the point? Like, this is already winding down. I don't, and I'm not really of the personality to do things only like halfway. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. And so that was kind of the, re the reason as well. It's like, I'm not going to put all this work in for like no end goal. Cause like, I just didn't, I was like, I've, I want to try something else. So I'm gonna, if I'm going to work really hard, uh, what else could I work on? Because like, this is, this is a means to an end. So I was like, uh, let me just redirect this energy. Cause I had endless energy and passion. I knew I could work hard. I just like needed a new goal. So how do you land on socks? I mean, socks is a, I mean, I, I hesitate to say commodity, but it's, it's a, it's a commodity business like selling envelopes. I mean, it's, you got to figure out how you're going to differentiate yourself. The good news is it's a giant market and generally people, I think wear socks, not everybody here at the beach, but um, in general, everybody's going to wear socks. And I think if you look at my wife, Yvette and I's sock drawer, I think it overflows into two drawers. Um, so people buy a lot of socks. Yeah. So as you know, in cycling, socks are a part of the culture. There's literally like a law, right? It's like, it has to be a certain height under the calf muscle. It's very specific. And you can spot a cyclist that's new by how they wear their socks or if they've got grease on them or something. There's like, there's a lot of rules and laws that like only a cyclist will know. Um, but I lived by those laws for many years. And like I said, I had a sock sponsor, but I didn't start a business or have the idea of starting a business right after I, uh, retired from sport there was like i mentioned i ended up going back to school because i thought that the logical path was 
I spent so much time in the system. I, I was on the national team. I worked with the coaches and the sport institutes and all of that. I was like, what would a career on the other other side of that table look like? So um, here in Victoria, there's Camosun College, which is at the Pisces building, which also has the Canadian Sport Institute attached to it. So I was like, I'll go get a, a degree in sport uh, management and simultaneously try to get a job at the Sport Institute and kind of like do two birds, one stone. I'll get the career, work on the development and be in the mix because I, I wanted to stay involved in sport. I love sport. Um, I didn't want to like retire. I want to retire from competition, but I wanted to be involved because I just I, I just love everything about it. I still wake up at like five in the morning to watch the World Cup races uh, to this day. Um, I just I, I very much love what I used to do and, and, and I'm a fan of it. So I did that. I got into the program. I was a mature student. It was kind of scary. You know, I was going to school with these 17, 18 year olds in sport management and had to get a job and, you know, like I mentioned, reinvent myself. And, but I did it and did, I, I got my first year under my belt. I got the job at the Canadian Sport Institute too. There's a unique story there too. It's like, by cycling for 10 years, you kind of learn how to do things a bit differently. There's no traditional path to kind of success in, in sport. And so, you know, the, the credentials needed for the job I got was a four-year degree. I didn't have a four-year degree, obviously. Um, but I knew if I got to meet enough people there, I could convince them to give me a job. So I just started volunteering for a bunch of their athlete studies. And a couple in particular that were very painful, like they were heat studies uh, in advance of the 2016 Olympics, where um, they wanted to see if we could do a heat adaption kind of protocol that would increase the blood plasma to increase the amount of, you know, so I did like a two week protocol on a heat trailer on a, on a bike and we had to do it dehydrated. And anyways, you get to know the, the Canadian sport Institute, sports scientists and people when you spend two weeks suffering with them. And I did it twice. Um, as an aside, I was a good adapter. I was able to raise my blood plasma by 20% with that protocol, um, which was, which was crazy. And that's naturally. Um, so I got to know them. And so then I was like, I saw a job opening and then I basically emailed the people that were dealing with me. I was like, Hey, like, you know, me, you know, I'm a hard worker. Could you put in a word? And I got the job uh, and I got a job in the talent development department, which worked with the Canadian sports school. And it worked with the, the, uh, the, the athletes on the way to podium performances and, and the Olympics. So it was great. I was like, cool. I'm, and I could go right from school to work. And I was like, I was doing it. So I was like, cool. Like on paper, I'm doing exactly what I set out to do but I just felt dead inside. I was just like, this is like, not what I thought. If you like work in these organizations, they're government funded and run. So they're slow, they're bureaucratic, they're awful for the most part. The people are great, they mean well, but it's just not the A team, that's for sure in most cases. Um, so I was like doing it, but I was like, this is not it. Like I can't, I, I can't even imagine doing 40 more years of this, you know, or like making this my career. I was just like having a crisis basically. So going into second year of school, I was just laying in bed. My wife's like, or girlfriend still at the time was like, yeah, you got three more years of school. You're like, you start thinking about what that career looks like after she's like pushing and, and in a, in a good way, but in an encouraging way, but like trying to force me. Cause I was kind of like just moseying through. She could tell I was not motivated or super excited about what I was doing. She's like, you got to find what you're excited to do. And so the, in an instant, what popped in my head was like, I'm going to start a business. Like, that seems like a fun idea. I've got three years to try and make it work. And if it works, perhaps I can just avoid real life. <laughs> and like, that was that was the thought. There was no other, other businesses I had started. There was no business experience. I wasn't in business school. So I was laying in bed. I was like, what could I do? I, and I really came up with the idea on the spot out of fear of getting a real job. But I knew I wanted, like, again, I, like I said earlier, I wanted to still be involved in sports. So I was like, okay, if, if, if the kind of like model I had pitched before to myself of like the, the school system and the, the sport institute system is not what I want, what would building a brand in the, in the environment look like? Cause like, okay, I, I, I idolize brands like Red Bull and Lululemon. They've done a great job in these categories. Like I want to build something like that. And so like I, I built, you know, I started I, like ideating in my brain about that and then so I was going to build a brand. At that time, our former name was called Endure. Um, we've since rebanded to Outway. Um, there's a whole story there. But um, and the brand was around like perseverance of an athlete, you know, like inspiring personal bests and celebrating that journey that athletes are on. Um, so that was kind of the, the first idea. And I was like, okay, I need a product category. Um, and socks came to mind because I was like, I know about, I know the sock business a bit from my former sponsor. And when looking at the category, like you mentioned, it's massive, 
And you would think from the outside that like, okay, if it could be done, it's been done because it's such a big category. It's like, of surely people have thought about how to disrupt this. But when looking at it, it was very boring and it was like, no one was attacking it. And I often tell young entrepreneurs now, it's like, look at the really big categories because no one, people are just assuming that someone, if someone could do it, they've done it. Um, and you've seen this disruption in businesses like razor blades, which is one of the oldest products ever. And then you have new business model innovations and dollar shave club is born. Um, and so with socks, I was like, who are the niche players? There's a couple big U S brands, a handful of really niche players, like in the cycling space and whatever. And then the really big brands like the Nikes of the world, there was no Canadian sock company on the D to C space, which is 2016 Shopify is getting some steam and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to build like a sock brand that serves the cyclist runner active lifestyle customer, but I want to pair technical construction. So it'd be a technically a technical athletic sock, but it needs to look really nice because I want to wear these when I go to work as well. So I want them to be nice and patterned because two trends were happening. It was athleisure trend was happening and guys in suits or women in suits or whoever in suits were using socks to express themselves like on the bike. So I was like, I want to merge those two things and create an all day active wear sock designed for expression. Um, so that was the idea, simple insight, like even, even more simply put a yoga pant for the foot. Like, why doesn't that exist? And I couldn't find it. It was either you buy a basketball sock or you buy a dress sock or you buy a cycling sock. I was like, nothing is really differentiating these that much other than people not focusing it, focusing on it hard enough. So I was like, I'm going to go build a yoga pant for the foot. I'm going to put nice designs on it. I'm going to sell these and I'm going to do it direct to consumer, the classic kind of cut the middleman out. Um, socks were actually in hindsight, a great category because you can't try them on anyways. They're light and cheap to ship. They're unisex with low size curves. I didn't think about any of this. I just thought socks were cool. Um, so it worked out that it was a good, good model. Um, I basically taught myself after having that light bulb moment, taught myself how to use illustrator to design the product. I started sourcing manufacturers overseas and I got my first product uh, run of 230 pairs within two and a half months of having the idea. So pretty quickly. Um, and I basically just loaded those up into my car, went to school and sold them around, around the school, like one by one to my friends and people. I was like, I bought them for basically, you know, X dollars, sold them for double that 50% margin. I was like, great. And I, I, I don't know if you've ever received 230 pairs of socks, but I was like, when they showed up, I was like, I'm going to have these forever. And the worst case scenario, I'll have a great pair, like a new pair of socks for years and I can use these. And it was only a thousand bucks out of my student loans. Like it wasn't a huge bet, um, but I sold them all in a week and people liked them. I was like, oh, great. So I had an inventory problem right off the bat because I had nothing to sell and a three week lead time on new stuff. But I ordered 700 more, uh, did the same thing, but this time reached out to some of my local contacts and was like, can I show up to the local cyclocross race and set up a booth and sell these to bikers? Sold some there, people liked them, people started wearing them. So just rinse and repeat, kept doing that. Sold them, bought more. Then I launched a little Shopify store. Friends from back home would buy them support. Um, and then started thinking like, how do I integrate with more events? How do I sponsor athletes, develop kind of like little marketing engines? And yeah, lo and behold, we had this little business and it did like 300K the first year, which was hilarious. Like I had no idea that we would do anything like that. I remember see, talking to an accountant like a month after starting. He said, you know, if you make over 30,000 in four, over four consecutive quarters, you're going to have to collect and remit GST. And I remember thinking, I was like, there's not a chance in hell I'm selling $30,000 worth of socks. Like you're absolutely crazy. And we ended up 10Xing it. So like, it was like another lesson of just not even understanding the opportunity and also like cool things can happen if you're willing to work for it. So um, yeah, again, long winded answer. There's just so much in the, the past eight, like seven years. It's uh, there's just, there's been so many lessons there. Like, um, but that's generally how we got into it. And, you know, we, we kind of doubled the business every year after that. And we bootstrapped it for a long time, bootstrapped it to over 10 million. And uh, before raising any money off that initial thousand dollar investment, which was not easy, uh, just like, but I didn't know you could actually run a business non, not profitable. I didn't know you could raise money. I didn't know anything about business, right? So I was like, surely the only way to run a business is to be profitable and cash flow. Uh, so I negotiated great terms off the bat and because I just knew no other way. I had no experience. I was just like some athlete with a, with a, with a goal. And it ended up being a huge benefit um, because I didn't make dumb moves. I stayed super lean. 
Um, and we, we built a lot of business model innovation. Like I, what I'll wrap up with is like, I mentioned, um, we had previous sponsors that wanted like custom socks. So I was sitting in class and one of my, my existing sponsors from muscle milk, uh, the leader there emailed me and she was like, Hey, we're doing an event and I want to give away socks to everyone that goes, I need 500 pairs. Can you put our logo on it? And, uh, and invoice me. I was like, yeah, no problem. I was sitting in class, did the mock-up on my computer, text it to her. And she's like, good, e like eight bucks. I was like, okay, cool. So I invoiced her and made like a few thousand dollars like that. And I was like, that was way easier than selling one pair at a time. And what was actually unique about that model is it was a pre-sale. So like I designed it, I sold it, I collected the thousands of dollars up front, um, then placed the order and then delivered it with net terms. So I had like 75 days of free cash flow. I knew what my margins were. So I just saved you know, what I owed the manufacturer and reinvested the profits in growing the inline. So now we actually today have two separate businesses that facilitate that. So we have our Outway business, which is the direct to consumer sock brand. And then we have Custom Lab, where we power the custom socks of huge brands like all over the world. Like we make socks for Red Bull and CCM and, and multiple other brands. And that's what's allowed us to con continue to cash flow as well as diversify the business model because we, those two businesses, they are separate. I have a GM that runs our custom business and uh, they rely on different market conditions, buying cycles. It's, it's, it's all pre-order. So there's very little upfront capital cost. Um, and so that was another unique kind of thing that just, again, like ever, everything I just said was not planned. I never have written a business plan. I didn't know any of this before. Um, you know, we, we plan and forecast now, but um, like this certainly was not a master plan. I couldn't have told you what a margin was. I couldn't have told you what a, actually I could have told you what a profit and loss was because the only course that I actually benefited from in my two years of college was my accounting course and it kicked my ass. Um, cause it was the only thing I couldn't bullshit. Uh, like I was very good at bullshitting I was a marketer at heart. So I was very good at philosophy and sport concepts and stuff. Cause you can, there's no real answer if you could argue a good point, but numbers are numbers, man. I remember I did my first, uh, first accounting exam. I didn't study for it. Cause I was like, I can bullshit this. And, uh, I actually answered it all and, and walked out there being like, yeah, that made sense to me. Like I, I made sense of it. I got the numbers that I got zero. I got a zero on it. <laughs> and that was the first time, like, I, that was very humbling. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to work. Like, this is not good. And uh, to this day, that was one of the most rewarding courses. The teacher was awful. Um, I actually had to reteach myself every time we would get something through YouTube. And I, he, the way he was teaching didn't resonate with me. He used a lot of real world examples where he just needed to teach the fundamentals. Like, it was very confusing. But um I still use, I, I've built on that foundation since, but numbers are the language of business and like, it's so important to know. So, um, but in that course, I didn't learn margins and stuff like that. So I, I, I did know how to kind of analyze the P&L a bit, but um, yeah, just super important to highlight for anyone listening that may, may feel like they don't know what they're doing before getting started. Man, I had no idea for years and we were run like there was years we were doing millions of dollars and I still really didn't know, you know, I was like kind of figuring it out on the go. So and that's true of any entrepreneur. Like uh, there's just levels to the game. You don't know what you don't know. And there's always someone doing something different, always something new to learn. So you got to get uncomfortable, uh, not knowing things and being okay with that and raising a hand and saying, Hey, teach me this or learning all the time. Cause I, I learn new things every day. Um, and I think it's when you think you're done learning is when you get into trouble. Well, I got a bunch of questions. The first one is you said you changed your name. And changing your name is <clears throat> from a guy who, I mean, this podcast changed his name three times, maybe four. I can't remember, Rob, but, um, you know, that you evolve, right. And, but it is a big lift. It, it, and as you get deeper, it gets deeper. So can you share your story on that? Cause that a, a lot of people get, I think one stuck or believe they can't change your name. And I believe you can. Um, but you do have to think it through and it, it it is a lift because of just all the branding and everything that you've built, including like a simple URL with SEO on it. You know, you got to figure out that strategy to transition. Since your name was extremely painful and not something we wanted to do. It's something we had to do. Um, I've had my fair share of like legal issues in the business as a result of not knowing <laughs> 
what I was doing. So like another thing we can talk about after is like I started it with a friend in college, had to buy him out. And we had a his uncle who was an investor at the time like got involved it was super gnarly situation it's the classic founder situation where like you just get yourself woven in these bad deals no shareholder agreement and things explode so i had to go through that it was lesson one lesson two was yeah like starting the brand like i said an idea cool name whatever it didn't do trademark diligence um and although um what ended up leading to our our ultimate rebrand was kind of a lot like for that reason um like we had looked into it enough where like there was a like we did have a, a a path to keeping the name but we would have had to kind of argue away the validity of protection protection against it so it was kind of a bad path but i, I can't talk too much about it either but anyways we didn't want to change the name we were five years in we built a lot like you said of you know goodwill around it seo in five years and we're a physical goods company right so like it's not just as simple as changing up the digital assets which are quite which is quite easy like easy to do has it's you know has all the long tail effects but um you know easier than changing out you know an entire supply chain and product infrastructure it's which is just a nightmare so yeah we, we've had to so we had no choice but it was incredibly painful but what i learned out of it is that like People don't buy your product or interact with you because it's called X, Y, or Z. Um, it is important, and there's no discounting how important a brand name is. But what people are ultimately buying is the value you provide them, whether it's the product, the service, um, what they get out of it. Um, and if you think about, like, okay, I'll tell this kind of, this is what I had to work through in my mind to kind of come to terms with we're changing it and how am I not going to go completely nuts, you know, and so stressed out is like, I think of kind of a brand in three parts. Um, there's the name, the identity and the essence. So the name is kind of a reference to what you're doing, right? So this podcast is edge podcast. Um, if you change it to something else, it wouldn't necessarily uh, change the, the content you're producing and, and kind of what the people are getting out of it. And we'll, we'll actually use a human as the example. So like, you know, your name's Brandon. If you changed your name to Alex, it wouldn't change who you are. Like it, it just is what it is. It's how I would reference you. Um, and at the same time, you're wearing a black shirt. If you, it, your identity, if you change your shirt to purple, it doesn't, you look a bit different, but it doesn't change who you are. But then there's the essence. You know, if you're one way when I talk with you and the next time you're completely different, I would argue you're not the same anymore. You might be great one day and an ass the next day. So what people are ultimately buying into is your essence, like as a brand, what you're doing, like who are they, who are they investing in? So you have a little bit of permission if you stay true to what you're delivering to change how you look or, or what you call yourself um, as a brand. Like those things are still incredibly difficult because there's value in people being able to recognize you and there's value in people knowing how to reference your company, obviously. But those are ultimately not the reasons they purchase your product or service. So if you're able to somehow like very consciously and very methodically kind of do that transition and communicate that and have a reason and a, a story and a path to why you've changed your name or you do a rebrand, change your logo or your color scheme, but you maintain the essence of the brand, I'd argue that you could pull that off as many times as you want. Um, you don't want to do it often because there are the sec like the lots of other implications like SEO and just things that take time and to compound and build. Um, but you know, when I look at our brand, we changed our name. People don't buy our socks. We don't put our name on them, right? Like people don't buy our product because they say outweigh on them. Um, so like when we thought about that, I was like, okay, cool. Well, like our essence isn't changing. Like we just have to remind people or, or let them know how this is an evolution of the brand and, and how the name references our brand. Um, so it was incredibly pre um, painful just kind of having to f five years in figure out a name that we could get that now is trademarkable that we can protect. Cause like, you know, I, the advice I got during is like, you made this mistake, you get a pass. The second time you don't get a pass. So don't mess this up. So it was just incredibly painful from a legal perspective of like diligencing names and filings and then changing all the product and communicating that. It was about a, we're about a year out from it now. We rebranded last year in May and like, it's only sort of now feeling like we've kind of got our feet back under us. It's just been, it's been, just been challenging to say the least. Um, but learned a ton um, and definitely like anything you go through in business, it's, it's a hard lesson, but it kind of builds that scar tissue and that muscle for next time because the challenges keep coming. You know, it's like, uh, like that was 
our first cease and desist that led to the ultimate rebrand. We've got some since and everyone that comes and, and they're not for the same thing. They're related to other stuff, but like, it's just, we're getting bigger. You become a target. It's like everyone that comes after it's like, okay, I'm a little more immune to it. I've got systems built. I've got legal teams. I've got processes to go through. I've got physical and mental things to go through to make sure I don't burn out or get too stressed or overwhelmed. So like, you got to kind of go through this stuff, you know? And it's just like, I, I, the way I frame it to myself and others now is like, you're paying your dues. If you want to be successful, like in, in business, particularly like these things happen, you know, some people avoid them and get lucky, but most people go through something like this. If you're going to build a big business, you're going to have legal issues. You're going to have co-founder disputes or employee disputes. There's just no way around it at scale. Um, and that's kind of like the benefit, I think, of talking to other entrepreneurs that are further ahead of you is you realize that you're not alone. Because like when you're going through it, certainly the first one, I was like, I, I'm the first person in the world this has happened to, you know? Uh, and that's obviously not the case. Um, and so it was really like, uh, it was helpful to have people at that time. I had built a network out by that time that had been through it and kind of coached me through it and realized, look, this isn't. I'm not an idiot because this happened to me. Like I'm, I'm not the first person to make this mistake. There's ways out of it. It's hard. It's going to be incredibly painful and incredibly hard work. Um, but you're not alone. So, and, and it's, it's never ending. You just get better. It's like running or, or cycling. Like you never get, it never gets easier. You just get faster. I think that's a good analogy. I think you're super lucky because mostly the co-founder issue that you alluded to, which I'm sure you can't talk about, but, that is usually the failure of the company. And, and, you know, I cringe when, when you said like, Oh, I did, it didn't have a business plan. I didn't have this, but you know, sometimes having that alleviates that. But the truth is, is <clears throat> I don't do it anymore. I always have that conversation up front. period. The reason that we all avoid it. One is you may just be like, you, maybe in your case, you didn't even realize you were building the business, right? You're like, Hey, I'm going to make some socks. Um, I'm going to do it with a friend. We're going to do it 50, 50, whatever it was, right. Money comes in and you're just, you're not taking it serious because like you said, you didn't even think you're going to sell $30,000, but you need to prepare for that and ha and people avoid that conversation because it's extremely painful. I don't know if that person was your friend, probably was your good friend, right? Maybe whatever. And you're going to have this conversation about, who owns what and the argument will come up like, well, I actually do this. I'm worth more. And how do you come up with that? And there's a bunch of ways, like there, there was a whole book written on this um, slicing the pie it's sort of tough because you got to keep track of your hours and do all this stuff, but it at least allows a formula to figure out who gets what, because there's always that conversation. And what I found Rob, which probably you did too, is once you're into it and you have the conversation, everybody's perspective changes, no matter if they did more, less, or equal. They will all believe that their part contributed to that success. And most likely, all the founders contributed to it and probably a little luck, right? A little luck being just grit, keep going forward, finding our way, being innovative, um, solving the problems all the time. But um People over, it's like when you sell your used bike, everybody believes the used bike or used wheels are worth more than they are because it's ours, right? You're like, no, that, I bought those wheels for $3,000. They're worth 2000 bucks now. And the guy's like, they're 10 years old, dude. Like they're carbon. I don't even know what's wrong with them. They're like, I'll give you 800. And then you feel insulted. But that's what happens in those things. So yeah, you're incredibly lucky. You're probably also persistent, so you made it through, but most people don't make it through that. Yeah, I listened to a podcast yesterday. As, um, I think it was Invest with the Best, like the best, and it was this guy, Jeremy Geffen, and um, he said, be hard to kill. And I, I resonate with that. It's like, I think I'm hard to kill because um, like you're right, like co-founder disputes take down most businesses and it was very close to taking us down. And you hit the nail on the head because it's very common and unfortunate occurrence like like you said you start it with a friend you don't really expect it to be anything you don't have the conversation and by the time you do it's too late once money hits the bank things change perspectives change but i share your perspective now that like 
that conversation, as hard as it is, is incredibly important up front. You need to have value alignment to be working for the same end goal, a deep understanding of what hard work means to both of you. Um, the share of like, it doesn't matter, like, like talk about what the share means, what the value means and, and, and how you're going to split that pie and, and all the other things you need to talk about, you need to air it all out. Um, and then at the very, like, also make sure it's the right partnership, right? Like you've got, um, opposing skill sets because you don't want to be butting heads and you really need two people or three people working on separate problems, not the same problem. Um, so yeah, a lot of, and certainly get a shareholder agreement like, duh, but, um, we didn't do any of that because it's like my advice to young entrepreneurs again, or first time entrepreneurs is like, if you're going to start a business, doesn't matter if how big or small or whatever, or you don't expect it to work, you have to treat it like it's going to be the biggest business in the world and take it seriously because as soon as it starts to work, it's too late. Um, and I, I always say like people start a business and it's very common to protect your downside. They think of everything that could go wrong. People often don't think about what could go right. And those cause some big issues as well. Um, often sometimes bigger because like, I also say to people is like, if it doesn't work out, that's fine. You you, know, you you can tell the story of like, I gave it a shot. It's almost like an entrepreneurial kind of like rite of passage. Like I gave it a shot. It didn't work out. You know, we, we tried real hard, but imagine you failed because it was working and you didn't capture the opportunity. That's going to eat you alive the rest of your life. So, uh, that's, I think, the most important thing to optimize for is like, if it does work, are you ready to capture the opportunity? Because you can protect your downside. That's fine. You should do that as well. But man, you should protect your upside too. Because like, and I didn't do that, you know, multiple times didn't, you know, like the brand change could have taken us down. The co-founder dispute could have taken us down multiple other things like, and it's impossible to, to think of every scenario, but there's some very basic ones. And unfortunately, though, there's not a a ton of great resources. There's no business school won't even teach you this. I do a lot of talking at the local university and uh, I don't know what they're teaching these business students, honestly. Like I, 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 I do like the program and the, the profs, but business is one of those things that you just don't know until you've done it. You know, like, and no teacher is going to tell you what's going to happen. Um, I'll tell you in 30 minutes more than you'll learn in four years. I guarantee it. Um, because you just have to go through it, right? It's like my other analogy here is like, you can read every book in the world about running a marathon. You're not going to know what it feels like till you get 20 K in, you know, like, and that's when shit's going to happen. Um, and so like, and so there's just, you got to do it and you got to talk to people that have done it, but yeah, just optimize for what could go right and make sure you're putting all the right things. No matter if you're going to start, do it, do it right. Yeah. In general, I went to business school and a good one. Um, you know, they're not teaching in general, in general, the majority of those students are not entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, that they're, they, they can be entrepreneurial or an entrepreneur in a big company. That is absolutely possible. And I did it. I mean, I worked at America Online and we built businesses within the business and you build the business plan and you build it all out and you got to get it funded internally and all that sort of stuff. But in general, they're not teaching. Uh, I went to business school after I'd already started a business. And, you know, until you've put your head on the pillow at night with a payroll that is due on Friday and it is Wednesday and you do not have the money in your bank account or, and, and that doesn't mean your company isn't doing well. That means that you just may not have the cash flow that like, like you could be PL positive and you could be killing it, but your line of credit, it got extended or you didn't get the line of credit or blah, 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 blah. Like, you, you, you can't, you, you have no idea. You have no idea what it feels like to be responsible for other humans with a payroll like that. And until you do, or that you've got all these orders and it's held up in customs at the dock and they're telling you some BS and you're like, it's a, it's a, it's a carton full of socks, man. Or it's shirts. I, I had a clothing company, like it's shirts, man. Like, to run the x-ray. I don't know. Like it's, there's nothing else in there. Like we got to get this out. And meanwhile, they're charging you every day, as you know, it's cause it's sitting on the dock in a storage unit. And it's like, you know, until you've been there and done that, or, um, it's just really tough to, to teach those things. I, I think business school can be helpful because it teaches you finance. And I think what you said is absolutely true. Like if you don't want to build a business plan, at least build your financials. And I would argue the fin the business plan is in the financials. 
it, you don't you don't understand that until you build a business plan. But all the tabs, the marketing tab, the HR tab, the sales tab, the uh, P and L, the cash flow. That's all the business plan, um, just expressed in numbers. That's when it really um, the rubber hits the road. I think so. That's just my commentary. I, I I did do it. My psychology degree might be worth as much as more at worth as much because it's just about relationships and in marketing it's about that. But um, I think some of the lessons going back to like I, I just to offer some tips is I agree with you. You can't over engineer the contracts as it relates to deals. But I did learn some things like you don't think about this stuff. Say your business is going well and your partner dies. Well. You better have something written into that deal that you get to buy those shares at a price from a valuation or those family members or that estate gets to keep those shares, but they move into non-voting shares. Because if you don't do that, you just wound up with a partner that you didn't even sign up with and guaranteed there's some family members somewhere, if you're making money, that are going to have their own ideas how to sell socks, right? And now you're in a bit, now you're... It's like you were assigned a new significant other mm -hmm. that you would never have chosen. Not that they're good or bad. It's just that you didn't, it's not how you started, right? It's like switching out your significant, switching, if you're a guy, you're switching out your wife or partner in midstream. Can you imagine <laughs> that? Like, hey, Rob, um, tomorrow, what's your wife's name? Jackie. Jackie. Jackie's gone. Jane's going to be in here tomorrow. You're yeah. like, I didn't sign up with Jane, right? Like... Yeah. So there, I, there's some basics that I learned um, from doing it that way. But, um, you know, you, you've you've uh, made it. Do you do? I, I was curious because uh, one of the things that I learned, my brother and I learned from the T-shirt business was inventory problems and inventory problems, especially around colors and patterns. And what I noticed with your socks, it feels like you have developed some way to to get blanks and make the patterns so that you're not stuck with a pattern that doesn't sell. Is that what you, have you done that? Or are you still actually taking inventory? No, we're taking inventory. We like, that was definitely a strategy very early on. Um, but our product and especially the way we design our socks is the print has um, some foundational elements, the actual construction of the sock that need to be done as well to um, mitigate some like stretch issues around distortion on the printed socks oh. um so there is inventory risk and we've developed systems and and kind of our, our own ideas of what does well and many years of trial and error but inventory planning is something that even seven years in we still continually have to fight with it's it's not easy there's a lot of great tech tools now but something we're still dealing with right now it's kind of been a big challenge the first half of this year with us so just managing inventory while we've been growing and some other kind of like delays and, and other issues. And but yeah, that's certainly um, like the thing I, I, I like the least about being in a hard, like a, a physical goods business. Uh, it's just like managing the inventory and all the logistics associated. Like we've got a, a massive order or re restock that's just stuck in Japan. So like, and I guess we just kind of found it today. Apparently there's been some really gnarly storms in Japan. Um, and that's the other thing is like, uh, you start a business five years ago or whatever, and now you have to be up to date with world politics and world weather. And you got to like de-risk that from a supply chain standpoint. Like, Oh, what if this war breaks out? Like what, how, what's that do to your business? It's like these things or a, pan a global pandemic happens. Now what? It's like, you can't even sometimes fathom the, I the problems you're going to have to solve as a founder. They're just totally like, yeah, I sell socks, but I also have to really know about like, what if, you know, there's an issue in China or if there's an issue in, you know, in, in Europe or, or if, you know, like the cost of a freight container goes from 2000 to $20,000, what happens then? Um, so it's, yeah, it's certainly been like a lot of lessons, but, um, no, to answer your, your initial question, we do have to do planning around each, each design, which is incredibly difficult because we're doing that across like 400 SKUs. Um, so it gets very complicated. Um, and you're, yeah. And so like, it's not just the design, but it's the, the design is it, geared towards more male or female and that has a sizing implication. Um, and, and yeah, it's, 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 it's not something I, I love doing, but we've, we're, we're building every day, better, better tools and solutions to manage it, but, um, we're not perfect. How big is your company now? People wise. 
we're a small, nimble team. So like our full time team is thirteen, including me. So quite oh, wow. small for how for like the size of the business we run. That includes the custom business too, which is pretty pretty interesting. Uh, again, because uh, we didn't have money for so long, I just, we just built like a like really great systems. I'm obsessed with how do we make this more efficient? How can we do more with less? Um, and really cut out the noise. I think there's a um, there's a natural kind of, especially for founders that raise money, you've kind of like that money burns a hole in your pocket and you, you think adding people, you know, adds, adds, you know, growth and stuff. But like, I love the concept of like addition by subtraction. Like what can we remove in complexity or in costs or in, in systems even because systems slow you down if they're not benefiting you. Um, and so we run extremely lean businesses and we, we use some outsourcing. So like in terms of like total people working on the business is obviously far more than 13. We've got overseas support. We've got contract support. Um, but those are just really for just helping with day-to-day -day execution across different disciplines. But in terms of full-time leaders and, and people touching the territory, it's yeah, 13, including us. And, you know, we're selling millions of pairs of socks. So, yeah, you mentioned uh, earlier, like a few years ago, you're doing over $10 million. So I imagine maybe the pandemic hurt you or not. But I mean, doing over 10 with 13 people, it's pretty efficient. Are they remote? Um, most of our team is here in Victoria. We do have some remote people as we're growing. Um, but I'm by default a fan of, especially for our brand side, the Outway team, and especially for our leadership on that team. Um, we're, I was saying this earlier, it's actually, it's like a lot of what we do is on feel like we're, we're building a brand and we're trying to tap into like a feeling of our consumer. And it's like, it's really difficult to do that without people in a room and, and those kind of like, I forget who said it. I think it was Sean Frank. He said like, he said these in, but no, no, just Sean Frank, someone else said these in between moments, like the moments that kind of come up and they're inspired when you're in, in an office with someone or around somebody that you wouldn't necessarily book a zoom meeting or a Google meet around. And that moment might pass that inspiration, that conversation doesn't happen. So, and I've hired leaders out, uh, have been remote and they've not worked well. And I'm not going to sit here and say that's because in person is the path. It was, there's multiple different things that lead to something not working out and there's great companies that do things remote. So, but for me, I think probably also as like a first time founder and someone who's still figuring it out, um, we've benefited from being in person again. Cause like, I also love what I do and we try to find people that love what we do. So it's nice to be inspired and around people as well. And we're young in our careers and, you know, it's still, still, uh, still inspiring to be around people. Yeah. I, I don't know that there's a right or wrong from, I mean, I'm more of a tech guy and those are remote teams and those are developers and quiet time and all that stuff sort of matters. Some in-person definitely you benefit from. Um, I think, you know, I've worked in a bigger office and maybe it works in a smaller office in the early days, but bigger offices can be highly distracting. Uh, I don't disagree with the bathroom moment is what I call it. Like you're in the meeting and you're walking to the bathroom or, or in there. And it's like, that's the moments that are the in-between moments, so to speak, that you capture. I also know that there's the in-between moments when I was working on something and I'm, and I'm interrupted 50 times. Um, <laughs> right. So there, there's give or take, and there's plenty of examples on both sides. I mean, Linux was, I think, I don't know how many, I, I, uh, the Linux operating system, now I forget, Rob, how many people, I, it's like 7,000 developers who never met and did it remote. Halo mm -hmm. ice cream out of, out of Los Angeles, which is um, like this ice cream, I guess, packed with air for lack of a better way to put it. But Yo, no, I've, I've had it. Yeah, I've yeah, had it. <laughs> I, I mean, they have 250 employees, I think, that are all remote. And that's a, that's a manufactured brand. But there's examples on both sides. I think it also is what, what, what you as the leader want. I think some of these companies are having people come back because they have a real estate problem. That's a different story. Like they got to justify their real estate that they buy, bought because somebody, you know, oh, I guess what are you going to do if you own 50 buildings and they're empty? You know, you, you got to find an excuse. So some of that's driven by that. It, the, I think the irony of that for me, Rob, is it's amazing that they all basically made a lot of money during the pandemic when nobody was there. So, you know, 
there there's a case for working remote, but I don't disagree with you. Like being in person, there is a chemistry. Like I would much rather be doing this podcast with you in person. Mm -hmm. I mean, the chemistry would be different. It's, yeah. it's good for sure. Um, but would it be better? Yeah. Because the in-between moment was before we got into the recording or something like that. So I think there's something to be said for that, but I, I, I could make, I could make a case either way. Um, and I think it just depends. There's not a right or wrong and it's work for you. You have 13 people. That's not a lot of people. Maybe whatever you said, maybe nine of them are in person and you run a highly efficient thing. So those in between things matter other, unless you're going to keep your camera on all day. I, I mean, which, which I guess you, you could do. So, yeah, well, I'm really excited. I'm grateful for you coming on the show. You've done a, a great job and, I guess um, I you did raise money. How come you raised money? Two parts. Um, one was just the opportunity to align ourselves. Like I would built a network over the, the year before raising money and generated a lot of interest from people that I looked up to and that provided a lot of value. And so like one part was getting those people involved in the business um, and having like after buying my co-founder out and, and doing the majority of the growth in the business solo, it was just extremely difficult. I didn't have many people to lean on. I didn't have a, like a, an ownership team. Um, and so it was like one opportunity to bring some people in that, you know, aligned them with me and gave them some kind of like further incentive to really kind of help. Um, so it was strategic in that sense. We didn't like when I raised money, it was just one email to, you know, 10 people, 10, 11 people, um, that I wanted on the cap table. And we, we raised $3.2 million um, off that one email, like in 24 hours. It wasn't like raising money, you know, it wasn't like the traditional, like, here's, we're going to go raise a round. It was basically me saying, okay, I'll open this round. Cause like, these are people I've built a relationship with over a year. I, I trust them because for me, bringing owners into the business again was very, like I had scars, you know, I was very nervous. And, um, but like I said, when um, I, I benefit from having those people that have been there, done that. And and these are people that are running exceptional businesses. They've been doing it much longer. And they're, I just, to me, I was like, it was somewhat selfish. I was like, I get to learn from these people and they're going to give us money to like grow the business faster and invest in, in doing cool things. I was like, this feels like, you know, this feels like not legal. <laughs> it's like, it's obviously very legal. Um, and uh, the other thing in, in like full transparency, because I think like I'm, we run a very transparent thing is like it, it presented an opportunity to do a small secondary. So I sold some of like I took a ton of risk. I spent my whole life. I think I was 30 when we raised the money, 31 being broke, broke athlete, broke founder. I didn't make I didn't make any money. You know, like in these things, you don't make money off salary. Like, um, and so I had, I hadn't, I hadn't just grinded it out. I had spent 150 grand of personal debt to like buy out co-founder. I had funded the business and I had every dollar had like, we got through the pandemic. We got, so I was like, Oh man. And then, so when the time came to raise some money, I was like, Hey, I, I had a child as well during that period. He was coming up on, on one years old or just, uh, um, yeah, but a little over one when we did the, the rounds, I was like, I need to like provide some, get some stability. There's an opportunity right now. Um, so a lot of things aligned, majority of money went into the business, but sold some secondary to just like, for the first time in my life, I had savings, you know, I was 30 before I had a dollar in my savings account, which was pretty wild because at that time we were running a big business or, you know, a small business, but big in, in, you know, for a first time and in, in my, my world. But, um, so that was another motivation is like, it was a great opportunity to kind of sell a portion of the business. I had taken a big risk to own a hundred percent of it again, when I bought, you know, the, the co-founder out. And, um, uh, so that, that was another motivation. So it was really just, you know, capitalizing the business so we could take some bigger bets, um, cause as cash, even though we're doing well, like you said, like, even we could be super profitable, we run a business where there's a lot of inventory carry. So like we like to take big bets was not really an option because the cash flow is tight. Um, and if we want to grow, we can't optimize for running even more profitable and cash flowing. Like we just have to kind of extend our runway a little bit. So that was, that was important. Um, and it's actually kind of timely now because a lot of, you know, the world is eating D2C brands alive right now. And we're sitting on some 
some capital and we're going to like look to go on a shopping spree maybe. So um, there's like opportunity there, which I really enjoy is like, can we, you know, can we get acquisitive? Can we grow through acquisition as well? Is that something that's interesting for us? Um, so it was kind of timely to raise, but yeah, the three motivations were certainly kind of like de-risk a little personally, um, align myself with people that have been there and can help expedite the process and then capitalize the business for the first time. Cause we had always just been kind of, you know, never missed a payroll and never even like, like we got pretty lucky, you know, like in terms of like the business just worked. Um, but it was nice to have a cushion. Why real quick, uh, wrapping up, why is the world eating DTC? Like what's the challenge right now in the DTC business? Cause I, I think, I think you're right. I think there was lightning in the bottle during a buying spree when everybody was locked up. And I think now, um, there was forward demand and now it's like a hole basically. Yeah. I thought a lot about this and a lot of people smarter than me have framed it well and I've learned from them. But what I, my kind of take on it is COVID happens and it pulls the future forward 10 years. All of a sudden everyone's buying online. Um, but during that period, so let's call it March through the summer of 2020, everything gets out of whack. And, and at that time, you're like, this is an anomaly, it's going to end, but it keeps going, the growth is there. Then you see all of the people you would look to as indicators for this staying, making investments. So you look at Shopify, growing their business, hiring tons of people, you look at Facebook, hiring tons of people, you're being told by all these industries that this is this is the new normal, like the future is pulled forward, like it's here to stay, everyone's buying online, you know, your brand, your DTC brands, if you were positioned well and did a good product, you were you were crushing at this time. You were just doing incredible if you keep inventory in stock. And we were benefiting from it big time. Um, and so that's great. You lean into the growth, you start investing. Um, during that time, we're also in the bull market where DTC brands were raising tech valuations. We didn't because I live in the, war the real world and understand like business you know, how business should be and how valuation should be positioned. I didn't want that stress of like saying my, my sock company is worth a hundred million dollars. Um, but DTC brands were taking the, the capital was everywhere at that point. So DTC brands were taking large investment rounds with crazy valuations at the same time. Um, there was tons, we we're in a zero interest rate market. So there were tons of these um, revenue based financing companies that were layering themselves between the banks and uh, the businesses. So you could get access. I mean, I could, during that period, I could have clicked a couple buttons with no document signed and got millions of dollars from the clear codes and shop, Shopify capitals and not understood. Oh, they tell you oh six percent effective fee, but give back some of your revenue, not really understanding the mechanics of these loans. Um, we never took any, but if you took those as well, and then you ride that wave into 2021, and then you get into 2022 and things start to go down. And so what you've done is you have your, your traditional way of forecasting has gone out the window. You have no idea what reality is anymore. And then things start to go downhill really quickly. So you find yourself, your last round was raised at a valuation that's just completely ridiculous. So you, the idea of going out and raising money is almost impossible. A, because the sentiment in the market's like very negative towards D2C brands and B, you'd have to take a down round that's down like 90%. Founders don't want to do it. At the same time, you've got this revenue um, based loans that take a percentage of your top line sales every day, paying back when your demand's gone down, but that percentage you pay back and your growth is stunted. And interest rates are up. So you're pretty effed. Like if you're a fan, if you did all of these things, you're in a really bad position. You're overstocked on inventory. Your debt is incredibly high right now. You can't raise money and you're dead. Like you're dead. Um, and so that's why the market's eating DSC brands alive is because, and, and it's not the founder's fault. Like, like I said, like, I think a lot of, I was lucky to be like those people I raised from are very, like a lot of them, a couple of the, the guys that lead, um, so my lead investor is Andrew Wilkinson of Tiny, and he's like hardcore, you know, like value investor, kind of like real business fundamental. So I was learning from him. That's why I was like, this doesn't make sense. I'm not leaning into things that don't make sense. Like, um, and others, my, who on my board, Jonathan Becker also runs exceptional businesses. And I surrounded myself with people that knew this wasn't real, right? Like prepare for this, Rob, like, um, so we didn't take the, the bad, the bad loans. We didn't raise at a crazy valuation. I wanted to sleep at night. Um, and so that's, I think that's what's happened is you've got, like, you didn't know how to forecast the world sh like changed very quickly. It's very apparent. Now I tell my team here, we're in 2019 again, 
this we're we're basically pre-COVID. This is this is the market. This is what growth felt like. This is what funding environment was similar to consumer sentiment. The world's open again. People are out doing things. Like we're in 2019 and we need to act like it. Um and a lot of brands unfortunately they just there's no way out of the hole. There's just like like two things kill a brand, debt and hubris. Right. And like these brands are just crushed with debt right now. Um and so unfortunately i think a lot of these brands still have three to six months of cash on hand so like you haven't seen the true carnage yet but we're seeing the deal flow um uh just through my network and through other brands and (laughs) there's a lot of people hanging on by a thread and there's just there's the likelihood of survival is very low um which works for stuff like us because there's these brands do have great assets um and so there's there's opportunity there for those that made some wiser decisions during that period or got lucky or still are growing. Um, but there's going to be a big reset and it's happening. Well, I appreciate you sharing all that and taking time out of your day to, uh, share all this and be open about it. It's been, uh, you've had an exciting ride and I think you still got more downhill to go. So it's more than 15 second ride here for you, Rob. Um, if you were to give listeners just three pieces of advice from all this, all of your experience from being a professional biker to running your D to C sock brand, what would you boil three things down to? We call them HPTs. I think of what we've, what we've talked about today. I think like the one thing that I've proven to myself twice now is that if you believe you can, this is so cliche, but if like you truly believe you can do it, it's likely that you can. Like I, there was, nothing to say that I should have become a professional cyclist. There's nothing to say that I should have started and and grown a successful business. I had no right to do either and no experience in either. So that's like, I truly do believe that like you can, you can, you can outwork these things and you can, you can find unique ways. So it's super cliche, but I've just done it twice now where I I just, I, I see people that put like limiters on themselves and say like, I can't do this because of X, Y, or Z. I'm like, it's, it's just in your head. Um, and of course there's certain things and there's, there's actual limitations that exist, but in most cases, the, the excuses that people are telling themselves aren't real. So that's, that's the real lesson. Um, I think two is the one that we talked about is that like, no matter how big your goal is, big or smaller goal is like, ask yourself what happens if this goes right. Um, I think that's a really important one that's, you know hurt me many times by not asking myself that question with the co-founder issue and the trademark issues and all that kind of stuff. Um, And I'd say the third one is that like, this one's that I've been thinking about lately is that it's okay not to be an entrepreneur too. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like it's sexy right now. It's in vogue. It's everyone wants to do it. But like, I'd say that if you're, if you're thinking about starting a business and you have to be convinced to do it, you're probably not the person. Actually, you're not the person. It's not probably. You're not the person. An entrepreneur is someone you have to talk things talk uh, out of, not into, right? Uh, they're on the ledge and they're going to jump, and you're trying to hold them back. And uh, so I think like recognizing and 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 being okay with maybe that's not you, because that's fine too. And there's huge value. Uh, my business relies on people that maybe have entrepreneurial tendencies, and 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 make a huge impact here. Um, and there's great, and, and those people often get options in the company or whatever. So there's, there's great outcomes for that too. And and that's totally okay. The world needs, uh, Batman needs Robin, you know? So like, um, I'd say that's a second line. I haven't really shared that one before. Cause I've been thinking about it lately. It's like, it's just okay. I just talked to so many kids these days and a lot of them need to need convincing. I'm like, then it, I can't convince you if you haven't got to yourself, like nothing I'm going to say is going to make you do it. Um, so the third one's like, it's, it's just okay. And maybe you're not ready either. Like go, go, go work at a startup and just get a taste for it. Cause it's also, um, fun, you know, 1% of the time, <laughs> the other 99% yeah. is, is quite hard. <laughs> so, uh, and you, you can't know that what I'm actually saying until you've done it. Like your laugh tells it all, you know, exactly what I'm saying. So, um, yeah, th- those would be the three. There's so many more, obviously. I think there were, there were a lot of things we covered here for sure that are, um, the war stories of business. And my friend calls it the daily knife fight, which is so true. It's just like, it's just, it's just a daily knife fight, but it's fun. There's nothing else I'd rather do as painful as it is just like sport. It's just, it's uh, in the end of the day, it comes down to waking up every day, excited to, to try and 
take on the challenge. It's, the, it's really just the journey, you know? Um, and I'll just close with one last thing. I don't know we're, we're going long, but like I've had the benefit now of like in cycling and, and business to have some, some small wins and achieve, like achieve things that I thought were like the end goal are going to make me happy. And you hear people talk about this all the time. Like if money can make you happy and sure these things help, but like I've achieved enough now and enough of these milestones that like seemed re like really crazy that to realize that like just the actual act of doing it and the pursuit is really what's fun. And every time I get too attached to the end goal or like it comes and goes, it's, it's almost demoralizing a little bit. But every time I tap into like, ask myself, why am I doing this? Like, what's like, what's the purpose? And just ask myself like, oh man, I get to sell socks. I run my own business. I could go play tennis right after this if I want to, you know, I could work later tonight. That's like, that's really cool. That's, that's the goal. And it's really hard as a founder or as an athlete to remind yourself that like, there's a really important or really thing, a quote from The Office, um, one of my favorite shows, and it's Andy nearing the end of the, the whole series. He says, you know, like, um, I wish that someone would tell you you're in the good old days when they're happening. Right. And so, like, I try to remind myself that, like, I'll look back when maybe I make it one day, whatever, huge outcome, whatever that is. I'll probably wish I was back here, like grinding it out because like and I'm sure you've probably been there. So. I don't know if I could leave with that and then watch that office quote. It's, it's just like reminds us like as hard as it might feel, it's like, this is what you'll wish you were doing when you're kind of older and you're out of it. Well, that's a good place to, to end Rob. Um, we will put your links in the show notes for listeners to outweigh and the wholesale company. And you can check Rob out in the socks. They're really cool. I encourage you to get some. And thanks man for coming on the show and sharing everything. We'll have to have you back like maybe in a year and see we're out way and you land down the, uh, further down the hill. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Happy to. Thanks. Bye everyone.